Good morning and hello and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for December, for January the 7th, 2022. This is episode number 92. On today's show, we'll discuss the debuts of the Chevrolet Silverado EV, the Mercedes Vision EQXX, and we get a better look at the Chrysler Airflow concept. I'm Dominic Chioni, Inside EVs forum moderator and Inside EVs editor. Joining us today is the convivial Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and host of the YouTube channel, State of Charge. We also have the mesmerizing Mr. Martin Lee from the EV News Daily Podcast, which, of course, is available on all the best podcast platforms. And, of course, Kyle Connor should join us sometime uh, from the majestic, practically palatial halls of the uh, Out of Spec Studios. He also puts together splendiferous videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. Oh, uh, okay. you, say, you say Out of Spec Studios, or is he still in the presidential suite of some Las Vegas hotel? Because oh, last I heard true. he was at CES. That's so, it. Um, he, he may well be living it up in Vegas. Last night, he may have been living it up in Vegas, which is why he may not be here now. <laughs> I, I right? think that's probably the case. I think, I think he's, he's sleeping somewhere in the back of the van, um, you know, and uh, had a late night out there. Who knows where he is, but he's not in the palatial studios of well, he, out of spec. He's been right working now. really hard over there, so he deserves a good night out at some point. Um, yeah. Let's see. So uh, before we really get going, though, I'd like to ask that you sub subscribe to the show. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button and ring that bell icon for notifications. Or if you're watching us on Twitch, you can ring that bell icon for not notifications over there. All right. So with that out of the way. Don, again. let me jump in real quick. We got a couple of comments asking me how sure. I'm feeling. Thank yes. you. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate last week in the uh, in the comment section of the uh, of our YouTube video. A lot of people were saying, Tom, get better. So I'm, not, I'm still not there yet, but I'm feeling better. Um, thanks for asking. Uh, this is kind of dragging on a little bit, and uh, I still can't <laughs> completely clear my lungs, but uh, doing better, and uh, thanks for asking, everyone. Right on. Um, okay, so let's kick things off with what we've been driving this week. Uh, see, Kyle's at CES, and I'm, I'm hoping he can join us so he can tell us about all the great things he's been doing there. He's been, uh, he took a, a boring tunnel ride, and he's been in the Model S Plaid with some uh, modifications and uh, BMW i4 and iX and color changing BMW iX and everything. But uh, all right, so Tom, uh, I don't believe you were driving anything this week. Oh, but um, that's that. That was just me adding uh, adding this right. video to the stream in case you saw something <laughs> flicker. Because this, right. I'm sure, is what Carl would be talking about. Um, his highlight of. His know, life, his, his entire life, life right? Man. Uh, so he, he just loves, <clears throat> excuse me, if anyone new to the podcast, Kyle loves weird and wonderful cars. Um, if it's crazy and, uh, and, and annoying and does weird things, then he finds it endearing, <laughs> uh, which is why he loves the Citroen Ami, which has got a 5.5 kilowatt hour battery, will do 28 miles an hour. But he was in a CES in Vegas with Vallejo, and they make the inverters and motors for Citroen for this, and they... Uh, because they can get access to the uh, to the BMS and the the control systems, uh, they've kind of essentially chipped it uh, and doubled the power. And so uh, they uh, and on French plates, I think they stuck it in a container, brought it over from France on French plates. They gave it to him and said, "Have at it around the streets of Vegas." And so he did. So go and watch this um, this video. I'm not sure what channel it's on. It's in the Out of Spec oh. Reviews channel. Uh, he uh, is absolutely effusive about. Um, this and it's clearly a terrible car uh, for, <laughs> for, for 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 nine you know ninety nine. It's not noisy. Of, uh, it's not a car, Martin. It's not even a car. It's a heavy quadrus. <laughs> yeah. It's a heavy yeah. quadricycle. Exactly. Um, yeah. By uh, by by definition, um, yeah. and it would be terrible for nearly everything that you want to do in your life with a vehicle. Um, but he, of course, in front of your friends, uh, you know, <clears> um, would actually, absolutely it's, love it's this. It's got some it's great got the, things though. He, he does a great job of selling it. Well, there's there's nothing to it. I mean, it's got a roof and it's got four doors. Uh, it's got indicators to show people you're going left and right, and it goes forwards and, and backwards. Right. But and for that reason, uh, it is absolutely made his made his life. He takes it out for a little drive uh, around Vegas, and it you know it genuinely looks really zippy, as well. Yeah, if you it does are actually. Doing, you know, city 28 driving. miles an hour is zippy. No, yeah. it, I think <laughs> I, I think I think they doubled it. I think they um, oh really, or at least they doubled the power, if not the top speed. It, it gets up um, to 28 pretty quickly. I think that's the deal. Um, It'll spin did, a wheel around the corner. He did. He did burn some rubber, but yeah, I think he got up to. I'm not sure. I think like 70 kilometers or 80 kilometers an hour. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so okay. on, on, on this version. Uh, it's a shame he's not here to tell us about it, but, so uh, I, but yeah. I know at the, at, the end of that, at the very end of that video, they, uh, they disclosed that they are working on a two-motor version of that with mm -hmm. double the power, possibly double the battery, and uh, hopefully they'll give uh, Kyle a ride. <laughs> they, they, they Anybody like who's even thinking for about it. that, just go get a used Fiat 500e or used Leaf or something like oh, yeah. that. I mean, uh, unless you've got a ton of cash and you want to use it as like a, a neighborhood electric vehicle, you live down in Florida by Dominic, and you know you want to <laughs> you want to just zip around to your friend's garage and hang out and drink beers around the you know three blocks away. But the thing can't function as a real vehicle, as a real car. It just I mean, it's I mean, a cool little toy, but that's all it is. It's a no, like, seven thousand dollar toy. There's no, no like, it's not cr crash zone or anything, zone like, that. Or anything like that. I mean, yeah. uh, I guess for well, in France, it's it's handy if you're you're younger younger because you can get you can drive it legally without a license, like the the restricted version, you know, the very slow, which. I don't know how people drive in France. I've never been to France, so but that sounds kind of sketchy myself to me. I, I could know, see but. in cities, in really tight cities, how that yeah. would be uh, 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 possibly a good way to get around. So I'm not saying there's absolutely no use case for it. Right. But here in the U.S., there's a very small use case for right. something like that. I mean, really tiny. I, I, I just don't understand why you wouldn't get a used. Even a used smart electric oh, yeah. um, smart is, 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 a, is a much better purchase than than that thing well, and, well this would be just safe. a lot cheaper it's smart electric. it's That's not true. that much cheaper than a used smart okay. electric drive okay yeah i guess so right uh all right hey so tom um i understand that you hope to convert your ford f-150 lightning reservation this week but ran into some issues um now the official pricing for the different trims and packages were announced this weekend. We have that post on uh, mm -hmm. Inside EVs. But do you want to give us, give us an update on, on your truck and uh, the process that you're going through? Sure. So um, I I, did, I reserved as soon as the the uh, reservations opened. I think it was May nineteenth. So I mean I was in the first fifteen minutes or so of reservations. So I figured I'd be really up at the front. Uh, and turns out I wasn't that quick. Well, or they're maybe not prioritizing everything exactly in the order that people place them because it appears as though I'm not going to be in the very first wave of deliveries. I haven't been sent an invitation. The way it works is you um, you have your reservation and then Ford is sending out invitations for you to configure. They sent them out yesterday. I didn't receive one. I see a bunch of people online have said they did receive the invitation to, um, to configure, and they have. I went down to my uh, local Ford dealer, spoke to them about it, and they basically said, yeah, you, you're, you're going to need to get that invitation in order for us to configure it. But what they did say was, look, give us your build. Um, so I, you can go online now and build a vehicle. It's not an order, but you can build it. So I did that. I built it, and I, I printed it up, went down to my dealer, and they said, look, we'll try to put this in under your reservation number. Uh, they tried. They couldn't. Uh, so, um, but for what I do understand, and the deal really wouldn't explain this thoroughly to me, I, I, from what I do understand, and I actually found some documents from Ford that dealerships can push a couple through that haven't been, um, that didn't get the invitation. It depends on how many reservations each dealership has. They get a couple, it's like four or five that they can prioritize and they can say, okay, this is a really good customer of ours. We want to put him up at the front. Um, okay. I, I'm not a really good customer to this Ford dealership. I've never bought uh, a, a Lightning from them. Uh, so, you know, I'm just, just but, but, you know, somebody walking in off the street. But, but surely an exalted member of the media, Tom. <laughs> Don't they do you special favors? Well, yeah, everybody should know this. No, you get no special favors. Like a lot of people <laughs> on my Twitter were like, oh, yeah, Tom, you'll for sure Ford will take care of you. You'll get one of the first ones. That's not the case. There is no special treatment. I didn't get pushed up. Uh, I didn't get any kind of special, you know, prioritization. I'm just, you know, John Q customer like you are and uh, hoping to get one as soon as possible. Now, I did speak to Ford this week because, uh, and people might have noticed on my Twitter account, I, I, I tweeted out a picture. My, my, my online uh, account with Ford said, you have no reservations. When I went to log in. <laughs> To, to, to see if I could or configure it, it said your account has no reservation. So I kind of freaked out a little bit. Uh, and I tweeted out a picture of that along with the picture of my email confirmation that I had a reservation. So what happened was um, 
Ford's website crashed uh, oh. because I think it was because so many people were trying to log in to configure and get information about the Lightning. So what happened was it, it they were having all kinds of server problems. So Ford got back to me when I tweeted that out. They said, hey, look, Tom, don't worry about it. You've got your reservation. We're having server problems right now. The website's down. That's why you can't find your reservation. But don't worry, you have one. And then the next day, my reservation showed up again in my account. So, okay. um, so I do. I, I I'm still there. Uh, and and I asked him at that point, you know, hey, do you think I'm going to be in the first wave? And the answer was, it looks like no, you won't be. Right. Um, but but what what they're going to do is, about every two weeks, they're going to send out another wave of emails inviting people to configure their 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 or, or turn their reservation into an order. So. Um, they said, it looks like, you know, you won't be in the first wave, but you'll be in one of the, you know, next waves coming up. So, um, you know, hopefully in the second wave or third wave, maybe in two weeks or four weeks, I'll get that uh, email that says, hey, you can configure your truck. I did the mock configuration. It's $80,300. I'm getting a Lariat with the extended range uh, battery pack and pretty much most of the options that you can get. Uh, and, uh you know, so that's pretty expensive, but uh, you know, I, I knew it was going to be around around that amount. I didn't go for the platinum uh, because there's not a lot of difference. The platinum in the same spec that I had was ninety three, ninety one, or ninety two thousand, I think. So it was an extra twelve thousand dollars, and the difference was, uh, you instead of an eight speaker sound system, you get an eighteen speaker sound system. Wow. The interior and the interior is nicer. It's um. It's the the leather is is an upgraded leather that's two tone. The leather in uh, in in the Laria is just black. You don't get a choice of color, and it's just you know single one color. The dashboard on the Platinum has like um, a brushed aluminum trim with real wood inlay, and right. the and and the all none of the lower trims have that. You can't even pay for it and get it as an option. Uh, and the Platinum has 22 inch wheels. The Lariat has 20 inch wheels, which I'd rather have to begin with sure. because the range is going to be better. Hey, so, I have a question though. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in the Lariat, do you get the big, like the Mustang Mach-E screen, the big like yes. uh, portrait style? Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. in the lower trims, I know you get the, like a smaller right. kind of screen, yeah, which I kind of like too, actually. I kind of, it's... It's, it, um, it, it looks pretty good. You're right. Um, uh, uh, the, the the small screen, the Pro and the XLT yeah. have that. Lariat and um, and and Platinum have the the the, the Mach -E screen. But I got the whole extra towing package. Even though I'm, I have no need to tow anything really. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be towing stuff just to test it out. So I got right. the max towing package and Sweet. and so forth. Oops. And uh, so pretty much everything that you could get, I, I have in it. And it's it's just a a tad over eighty thousand dollars is my build. Worth, okay. worth saying, actually, we should say hello to uh, uh, someone who's trying to join us at the minute. <laughs> no. if, he, if he can work out his hotel Wi-Fi, he's Good there. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Hey there. How's it how, going? How is Vegas? Oh yeah, we are actually just on the way home, so we're in Utah right now. And, okay. Uh, yeah, Vegas was insanely cool. Right on. We talked a little bit already about your your dream car. I don't know if, um, but you, you didn't see that. So, I'm, I'm, but if you want to add something about, you know, I don't know, Tom. Actually, Tom, are you finished with the, your F one fifty? Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. Okay. Um, you want to talk about the Ami, the best thing in the well, world? Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, this was truly incredible. I mean, we uh, th this happened totally at random. We were just walking down. A pathway and I looked down and I saw an Ami and I'm like oh my goodness how is this possible and um, we went down there and the guys were just so confused as to why 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 do we like this car they're like this is silly <laughs> but they were awesome they were good sports about it and they're like you do you want to drive it like you seem really into it and we were like absolutely we want to drive it and uh yeah them, and they, they were surprised because nobody ever really wanted to drive that before <laughs> that's right they were like we didn't even think we should bring this thing <laughs> right on it was amazing they flew it over from france for this which was cool they brought a whole bunch of weird cars over they brought a plug-in hybrid mercedes glc as well which was very interesting so um yeah and, and some other cars they had um, Mercedes EQS, ID4, XC90, Lincoln Continental, but like this is Vallejo, so they make you know they're a supplier to automakers, but they're also getting into the e-bike space. So we also rode an e-bike with an automatic transmission, which was really oh, interesting. Yeah. So it automatically shifts based off of your 
pedal pressure and speed and that worked really well and all around was a really cool experience with those guys yeah that bicycle sounds interesting i like that we were talked about that the other day and it sounds like super smooth and just like i don't know it sounds like a great experience yeah that bicycle was yeah well first of all it was the first e-bike i've ever ridden a pedal pedal assist e-bike and right. um that was just seriously like such a great experience because it, I, first of all it, it was really fast like it was a thousand watt peak so it was oh really a watt peak motor Ooh. and that thing took off like a rocket that's, ship. that's a lot of power for a bicycle <laughs> yeah it moved it was awesome right on um okay so uh we want to talk about a few of the things that you that you did there at ces or what you saw so uh do you want to tell us i mentioned earlier too that you you went on a little ride in the boring tunnel um so i don't, yes. wanted to give us just a quick thing about that yeah you quick thing about the boring tunnel it was uh surprisingly boring uh in the <laughs> literal sense it was really cool like you just get in a tesla and you drive down this little pathway and then you get out, you know, look, at the end of the day, I was really excited about this. I thought it was really cool, but no one seems to like it because it, you know, they're like, just put a subway down there. And honestly, I have right. to agree. I don't, don't really understand the, the, the need to have all these Model Ys going back and forth when you could just have like a pod that could slide back and forth like right. a train. So it's really neat. It was fun. It was a great experience. It was cool to talk to the drivers. They didn't seem to have any restrictions. Like people were asking, like, are they allowed to talk about Elon? Yeah, the people were bring. They were bringing Elon up. Like they didn't seem to have any restrictions. They were nice, uh, right. and they they like were were open about everything. And they're just like normal people who are hired, you know, on an event basis. So right, um, they a lot of them had never driven a Tesla before, and were just you know into the cars and were like, wow, this thing's so fast. Well, the um, thing about the, and we uh, heard some, from someone, you know, they have a top speed limitation of 40 miles per hour. We heard, I think, what was it, Jordan, that 117, someone hit in there. Someone hit 117 <gasps> in there, I think, like on their last day of work or something. Um, either they got fired or they were quitting. But that's a pretty spicy speed in that tunnel. Yeah, that'd be crazy. I mean, if you've driven like hundreds of times already, maybe you feel the confident that you could do that. I don't know. But just speaking to the know. subway. I would like to try it. Just speaking to the subway thing, that would be nice. But the, you know, to build a subway is like super expensive because that—that's a whole thing about this. The, the hole is small, like the, the tunnel. It's like the diameter of it. It's you know, it's it's small, so it's a lot cheaper to build than the huge tunnel that you have. It's like exponentially exponentially more expensive to build a, a huge you know train tunnel. But they could you know have like you say even like in this situation they could have like a shuttle with different cars attached to it so you could carry more people at once but still i don't know you were there it's pretty busy i think you said there were up to like 60 vehicles at one time and uh, 80 actually so 80. yeah the, the first day we were there there were 60 but then we we did it yesterday and yesterday was running at max capacity so they had okay. 80 cars running at max throughput and I have to say it worked really smooth like there were no lines on either side and people okay. were just in and out and shuffling through it, it worked well really in my right. opinion so uh, there was a little video that popped up on the internet yesterday, uh, and it was all over Twitter. Uh, there was like a bit of a slowdown, uh, you know, traffic slowdown. So, you know, I, we've never seen that before in the tunnel, and you know, everyone was like, <laughs> yeah, well, with uh, eighty you know, cars and so many people and, getting off, I guess that makes. I think sense. they closed one we station. Didn't I think was the, that. I think the explanation was one station was closed or something at one point, and um, so I didn't it caused hear some, about that at all. Yeah, I don't know. It, anyway people were having fun with that but anyway uh so let's talk about something else that you did drive though um so model s so you drove some sort of model s plaid with some i don't know modifications or something oh just wheels yeah just just different wheels so n nothing that will change the way that the car drives um yeah my friend uli uh designed a wheel called the new aero wheel and okay. uh, we decided to make a video because uh he is in the european market and he's branching oh. to the u.s market here pretty soon and so uli um 
you know, basically found a plaid here in the U S and slapped it on, uh, slapped his wheels on that car. And we, we talked about the design, the engineering of the wheels a little bit, but we also, um, took the model S plaid for a drive. And I have to say compared to the one that I drove three months ago, which I was really excited about and really genuinely loved, uh, this car was even more, uh, well put together and had okay. better driving dynamics and just felt like one step more solid. This was a brand new one. And so you can tell there's a big quality difference between our friend Brandon's car in town that we use for our plaid stuff and this particular one. And it left me really wanting a plaid, like badly. Like this is a great all around car. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Huh? And, um, yeah. I understand there were some donuts made on the parking structure possibly. Oh, yeah, yours, and that was just a joke. It really wasn't us. I don't know who oh. did that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, haven't, yeah, I, no, I haven't had a chance to watch the whole video yet, but Uli is great, by the way. Uli is awesome. Uh, obviously, you know him. He came to our EV Media Summit and uh, brought another plaid, which was cool. So the German has more plaids than most of the Americans do. And uh, really cool, cool guy. We... Um, you know, there's a couple things I want to try with Plaid here coming up because track mode was just released and this is a big deal. So I want to, uh, we're going to grab our friend Brandon's car, bring it track and actually do a track review of the Plaid soon. Right. Um, all right. So you also drove the BMW i4. Now, Tom's driven that car already and I think he's, he's told us about it somewhat, but I just want to get a quick uh, rundown of what your impressions were were of it. Is it like compared to your like the Tesla Model S3? Did you drive the M, M with the performance version? Yep, drove the M fifty, the the top spec. Okay, and how? how what did yeah, you think? and basically, uh, so so Tom uh, loved this car in uh, in Europe, and I was surprised, and I'm like, I don't know, like, yeah, it seems really good, but then, but then Tom was like, this thing drives amazing. I mean, you, Tom, you were really impressed with this car. So then I was like, oh, my goodness, this is going to be a, a really serious machine. So we got in it. Um, we only had 15 minutes to drive the car, to be honest. We were we stole it from a whole bunch of people trying to go for rides. But BMW were like, OK, here you go. Just take it and bring it back as soon as possible. And um, it has some weird things. First of all, it's pretty much the same exact car as a 4 Series Grand Coupe, which we've reviewed uh, the combustion version of this car. And okay. typically when you have an electrified version of a combustion car, there are some trade-offs and there's some issues uh, that go along with that. And I have to say this didn't have any of those weird anomalies where the car doesn't feel constructed as a solid piece, if you will. It felt really solid, very well thought out, amazing EV settings as well. For example, you can set your maximum state of charge uh, limit from... 20 to 100 percent in five percent increments really nicely thought out there's also a setting in there where if you're parked in a quiet environment like in your garage or something and the car is charging and you don't want the fans to kick on uh, because you don't want to hear the noise you can limit the external fan noise and it'll just slow down your charging so it doesn't overheat i mean like they really thought of some very interesting and innovative things here with this car and then the driving dynamics were a, a real standout to me because, first of all, 530 horsepower, right, Jordan, something like this. I mean, it rips. It felt just as fast, if not maybe even a little bit faster than my Model 3 performance. Like, this thing boogies. And then um, in the corners and, and even cruising, it's a little soft, so it's, it doesn't beat you up every day. But it handled, you know, naturally very well. There is a very odd sensation, though, where it does torque limiting by steering, uh, basically, input. So if you have any lock on the wheel it will, and you floor it, it will cut power and then progressively feed in as you bring the wheel back to center. This was extremely annoying, um, but <laughs> we fixed this just by turning DSC fully off. So if you turn traction control off, then it gives you all the power all the time. Hmm, interesting. The uh, the Car Wow YouTube channel did a drag race with this and uh, Model Three Performance, uh, and this one, but by a few meters. They're basically right. the same, the same car, the same car. And actually, when you you know if you watch that video back at super slow motion, it's not 
a scientific drag race. It's just, it's not done with lights or anything. Um, it's just, you know, one of their camera crew waving their hand. And reaction times are different. On another day, it could be the Model 3 that wins. They're basically, performance-wise, so evenly um, matched. But it's, it's, it's personal preference then. You know, do you like the minimalism or are you a BMW fan? Um, I personally don't do not get on with the software. I find it... I'm sure you get used to it. It's like, it's like anything, isn't it? It's like, uh, you know, muscle memory when you know what you're going for. But I, I've i never got on with BMW's iDrive. So you don't hmm. like the iDrive in the car? No, oh, I've just never I got... I love it. I find it overly complicated. And I like to get into the weeds with stuff, but I still find it overly... It's, it, it's, it's German over-engineering. It's like they've just done... Because they could just do stuff. And I'm like, I can't get on with this. And this right. has yeah, the latest I, version I, you know, of iDrive. I have to agree. It's, it is very complicated. And the initial setup process is quite crazy. And with iDrive 9 in these cars now, they they did a really, I think, poor job of arranging all these maximum number of applications. It's like they've stuffed so much in the car, but they haven't arranged it in, in a logical manner. For me, I actually don't mind it. I thought the system was really snappy. I thought it had good good quality displays. I don't like the uh, gauge layouts because I prefer circular dials and this has this weird, the same with the combustion BMWs I complain about. I don't like the dials and the new ones. Um, but um, yeah, I guess the, the infotainment I was really into personally, if, if that means anything, I just thought there was a lot of everything I would need in the car right there. Yeah, I found the new iDrive to be better than the previous version also. And, and Mark, I think it's part of that is that Kyle and I both have had a lot of experience with iDrive, so we're comfortable with it. And the new inter iterations, while they improve upon it and make some changes, the basic bones is still the same. So if you're familiar with how it works, it's very easy to just um, you know learn the new iteration. Uh, so I found it to be really snappy, pretty intuitive. Uh, I, I liked how everything was laid out. I, I appreciated, like Kyle said, that there's so many different settings to let you set up things so well. Now we have a comment here that John, uh, asked about why would you care about running uh, the fans running in the garage? This goes back to the I3. The I3 had a very loud fan in, in, in the car and customers complained about it. I mean, I, I could hear my I3's fan blaring away when I was in my, my living room, which is next to my garage. I could hear it out there. And when, when people first got their I3s, they were freaking out over that. They were like calling BMW and saying, is there a problem? Like I actually made a video on, and I put it on YouTube where I'm, I'm, I, I recorded it. And I'm like, if you hear this, it's normal. Don't freak out. You know, this is how loud the fan is. Uh -huh. And um, because that's how many people. So BMW had, Kyle, a bunch of focus groups based on i3 owners and asked them, what would you like the vehicle to do? And, and out of that, they got the fan. They got the maximum charge setting. And they listened. And they, you know, they actually, you know, listened to the i3 owners and said, okay, you know, people are asking for these type of settings and so forth. And then they implemented them in this next generation of cars. So, you know, good on BMW for listening to their owners and, and uh, you know, actually doing something like that. So that's, that's, that, that's the first time I've seen anybody limit uh, any EV allow you to limit how loud the fan is. Right. And uh, you, you don't get that from engineers. You only get that from customer feedback. Yeah, that's 100% accurate. The engineers want to keep everything cool. But, Tom, we, we totally agree. When we – Jordan and I were reviewing the car, and the video will go up tomorrow, I think, on Out of Spec Reviews. Um, we said the same exact thing. It is sort of like this does everything the i3 didn't do that I wanted it to do. It's like they, they fixed everything. And so I'm really into this car – um, I don't think I would be in the market for uh, sort of this size of vehicle again. I think, you know, Model S is close, but that's a little bit bigger. And yes, they both have lift backs. It's a great option. Uh, I think I would be more in the market for the iX, which is the SUV version of uh, BMW's offerings. It just looks terrible in white. Truly not a good looking car in white. <laughs> but I think we, fi we figured out because we spent, literally a whole day with the ixs around us now and okay. the first i love the back end of it love the side profile the back of this thing looks awesome and going yes. down the road like maybe it doesn't render so well in photos but like cruising around when you see this thing from the back you're like whoa that looks awesome then you see the front and it's like shield your eyes um but <laughs> in black it looks 
somewhat less terrible. Okay. So you had a chance to um, see a, a special BMW WIX and talk about it uh, for, you did another video for a different channel, the BMW blog, which is a great source of BMW information. Um, but so they had a, a color changing BMW IX there. So it's white sometimes, and then, you know, you flip a, push a button and it turns black. And I don't know, it, so you did a whole video, you spoke to an engineer there. Uh, so tell us about that. Yeah, so um, we were gonna film a whole bunch of videos for our channels there, but our friend Horatio at BMW blog, and Tom knows him really well, um, We uh, he couldn't make it to CES this year. So he was like, hey Kyle, can you just like, shoot a little thing on these cars for us. And I was like, oh yeah, no, no problem. We'll, we'll just do it. We're there. And um, yeah, th then we just spent so much time doing stuff. We didn't actually get any videos for us, but that's okay. We had a, had an absolute blast. And you know, I've, I've been a BMW blog fan uh, my entire life because I'm a BMW guy at heart. And so, um, you know, gr grew up a fan of BMW and mini and other, other brands on, in the organization. And mm -hmm. this was such an interesting uh, color changing situation where we kind of unknowingly snuck in before the show. We just walked in. They let us in. We're like, can we go in here? They're like, yeah, go right ahead. And they were parking this and staging it. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't think anything of it. I thought like the world had seen it and it wasn't that big of a deal. And we put this video on Twitter and I think broke the internet with this thing. Um, but, but I was really silly because I did not think that this was going to be that interesting because I guess it wasn't sliding around a track. It didn't appeal to me so much. <laughs> and so I was pretty dumb. We could have filmed a whole video before everyone and put it on YouTube and probably made a bunch of money, but that's okay. We, <laughs> some of these things you just learn, but it is, uh, basically e ink. So it's a very similar technology to a Kindle and it requires a very low voltage, low current a DC charge in order to change the material from one color to another, but it requires no power to hold the material in that current state. Um, what's interesting is, yes, you do have to run a uh, current to each of these panels. And I was curious how they did the wheels because those are currently spinning. So I was like, how do you do this? What they do is they put a little battery pack inside the BMW logo in the wheel. And then that electrifies all of the things there. And so it sounds like it's such low power and the technology isn't really that special. Look, there are things that need to be adapted to it, but they're used in tablets or Kindles and all of these situations. So they were like, no, this can actually make it to production one day. And the nice thing is it doesn't have to be white or gray. You can choose any two colors you want. You can choose pink and orange if you wanted to. Uh, and you would spec the car this way. There's also another technology we asked the engineer about where they have four colors inside of capsule and it can, you can really make the car whatever color you want. It sounds like that's more complicated, more expensive, and maybe a little bit more sensitive. Uh, my understanding was uh, that this paint on this IX, this color changing is very sensitive to temperature. When they were setting the car up, they were using heat guns to take a look at the temperature. They had another one identical to this vehicle stuffed in a trailer as a backup uh, in case the temperature got out of spec. And so, yeah, it seems like it's it's an early day concept, but it actually seems like this one might make it to production one day. Really? I got, hey, Martin, I've got a little video I can share with him here. Let's see if I can get this to work properly. I probably would have done the same as you, Kyle, and, and not really reported on it big and jumped on it because it, it, I've seen this before. You know, we've I've seen this in other cars, um, you know, not OEMs really coming out with it, like third parties that develop that technology or whatever. So like, I probably would have looked at it and been like, oh yeah, that's cool, but not thought of That's what. exactly what I did. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, that's cool. I would have done the same. Yeah, Filmed the but thing like for we've seen seconds. it before. There's videos on YouTube of cars that do this. Yeah, so. but it really, like people really somehow connected with this and just ran anything on this. Just look, it's done like over a million views on Twitter. Um, and I don't understand why. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, pretty interesting. It's cool. Yeah, people are going to be flossing with that down the. That's going to be great. Um, all right, and that's kind of nice. In, in as someone was mentioning in the like in the winter time, you could have like a, a black car, so you know you could absorb whatever heat you can from the sun in cold climates. And in the summer, if you're in like in Florida, you can have a white car where and it stays a little bit cooler, so it helps well, with efficiency. You could, you could also bit. write messages in there or put emojis oh, on right. it too. That's true. 
I'd be I cool. mean, the, the possibilities really are limitless and it would be really fun. Um, everyone's comment was like the bank robber comment though. They're like, Oh, yeah. oh I'm going right. to rob the bank with the gray one <laughs> and switch to white and no one will see me. I'm like, I don't know. That seems like a pretty impractical use of the system, but um, you know, I think it's a, it's a cool technology. I'm, I'm actually really hoping that this does make it to the market. It's still early days. This is years and years away, but it seems like uh, everyone at BMW was convinced that there is a path forward. And let's not forget BMW is a pioneer with paint because 10, 12, 15 years ago now with the E90 M3, E92 M3, they debuted their frozen paint offerings, which I believe they were the first OE to do that. And it was a car that required special care, but they really made an expensive, cool, frozen sort of, um, uh, you know, matte paint finish that was a little silky into their cars. And, and uh, now uh, even Hyundai's offering that, that type of paint in uh, Ionic. It's pretty cool. Right on. All right. Um, so, I, okay, real quickly, I guess you drove an iX50 as well. Um, yep. And just real, real quickly, what would you think? Uh, Tom loved it. Would you yeah, buy one? The, here's the problem with the iX is no one will ever know how amazing it is because they will not get past the grill. Okay. If you walk up to that car blind, sit inside, it is huge. It has all the space in the world. The back seats are amazing. The front seats are unbelievably comfortable. I think it might be the quietest EV I've ever been in. The yeah. drivetrain's extremely stout. It's so comfortable. It handles really well, actually. Like, you can slide it around a bit. You can't go full DSC off in the 50i, but you can go DTC Sport. doesn't matter. It's a comfortable electric SUV. No one's really going to drive this thing hard. But what's cool is it's really a design study on wheels. It's like the i3 where they let the BMW designers go down this thought process of what should the future of driving feel like for this sort of upscale, sort of trendy, fashionable way. And I have to say the entire vehicle is near perfection, but wow. no one will ever know because everyone thinks it's ugly. Right. Uh, well, let's see. I think it's going to sell well, Kyle. I yeah. think people are going to get past that and I think it's going to sell well. Let, let, yeah, so let, in black, see. it looks really good in black. The interior is insanely good. And and to be honest, like, uh, you know, we, we have been thinking about getting an electric SUV because we have the dogs and we're looking at e-tron and uh, now iX and, of course, Model uh, Y or Model X. Uh, and th this is by far the top choice. This really? is so far and above any of their electric competitors in the SUV segment that BMW just took a whole new approach. They put in really interesting technology, really amazing driving dynamics, and they just nailed it right awesome. on the head. This is an amazing car. I just think, uh, yeah, someone will come up with a bumper kit to fix the, the thing. The, the front of it, uh, I would like to say is growing on me, but it's not, but it doesn't stop me from, appreciating the rest of the car and right. uh like the side profile and especially the back of this thing looks awesome uh, but what's interesting though is the 22 inch wheels have more range than the 21 inch wheels i don't yeah that is bizarre that. right yeah there's some interesting things going on but but really just a did not feel like a uh like we oh we have to make an electric car and we're just gonna put this thing together like no this is this feels and i would argue this is the best driving bmw for its intended purpose in the entire lineup. And I've driven every BMW on sale. Uh, wow. And this by far achieves its design goals better than any of the other cars. Right on. All right. So let's talk about some uh, news. So th there were a few things going on this week. I, th I think we should probably mention. Uh, okay. So there's probably no argument actually that the big news of the week was the debut of the Chevro uh, Chevrolet Silverado EV. General Motors CEO Mary Berra hosted a virtual presentation since they pulled out of uh, a physical appearance in Las Vegas because of the coronavirus is flaring up pretty badly. Um, so now regular viewers of the podcast know I've been pretty optimistic about this vehicle and now seeing it and learning more about it, I, I still am. I, I think the time frame is, uh, is a, the fly in the ointment, but uh, let's talk about the, what they debuted to start with. So. Basically, they showed off several different trim levels, but the main focus was on the top-of-the-line RST and the commercial-oriented work truck trim. 
Uh, we did get a bit of a sneak peek of the Silverado EV Trail Boss as well. Uh, built on the Altium system and sharing lots of the same components with GMC Hummer EV, the Silverado will have around 400 miles of range with the big battery. That will be an, an 800 volt system. So it has a, a peak charge rate of 350 kilowatts and they claim it can, from a low state of charge we assume, add 100 miles of range in about 10 minutes. Uh, for now, at least though, it gets a dual motor configuration. So acceleration is a bit slower than the tri-motor version of the Hummer EV. But zero to 60 happens in under 4.5 seconds, they say. So that's still plenty fast. Um, but you, ha you have to engage a boost mode called wide open watts, or wow for short, to, uh, to hit that number. Uh, price starts at $39,900 before destination for the base work truck. Uh, and that's probably with a smaller battery. And go up uh, from there with MSRPs for the various trims around 50,000, 60,000, 70, 80, and more, they say. Uh, so there's, there's so much involved with this vehicle and its features. We can't talk probably about everything today. Uh, it's just like, there's a lot, uh, but there's still a good, uh, piece of time before delivery start. So I'm sure we'll be talking, we'll talk about this more in the future on the future shows. Uh, so stay tuned, but Kyle on a scale of one to 10, how impressed were you, were you by this Avalanche EV? We may have just lost oh, Kyle. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure Tom, I'm sure Tom I, has I, an opinion. I, right. <laughs> Tom, on a scale of one to ten, how, were you, how impressed were you by the Avalanche EV? I, I like it. You know, I'd say eight. Um, the big, the big uh, negative is the timing. You know, um, I've had already people reach out to me say, "Hey, Tommy, you're going to cancel your F-150 and go for the the Silverado?" Yeah, and wait two more years. I mean, I'll most likely get the uh, the F-150 Lightning sometime around um, June, maybe uh, maybe May. Uh, May or June, somewhere around that time frame of, of this year, the first edition Silverado, which is right. the loaded 105,000, actually almost 107,000 after the destination, uh, that's going to launch in the fall of 23. But the the regular customers, like I would fall into that category, the, the, if I wanted to get, say, an $80,000 version of it like I have for the F-150, they're not coming out till till mid-2024. So Summer 2024. Yeah, yeah, it's literally two years later. So yeah, it should have better specs. Uh, that you know, it's it, if it's launching so much later. Look, I like it. I think it's great. Disappointed on the timing. I mean, I, I, they shouldn't be surprised because they're just introducing it now. They weren't going to be bringing it out eight months later. But um, that's the one negative that I find on 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 it is is that you know the the Silverado pickup should you know should be launching very close to when the Hummer EV is launching, you know, it's, right. that's their bread and butter. Uh, you know, it's kind of odd that they're just, they're going to give us the, the Hummer for a couple of years before we get the, um, the, 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 the Silverado. I like it. Seems like it's got great specs, but I'm not waiting two years for it. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the thing, right? The timing's like, oh, like I, I, I like a lot of things about the Hummer, but I, I just, I don't see it as like a, a necessary sort of vehicle. And I, I think, I really think they should have went with the Silverado EV first. And I, I noticed you didn't, maybe you didn't catch it, but I called it the Avalanche EV at the beginning because it's very much the body style. It looks a lot like the Avalanche. So one of the big tricks with this thing is the, uh, what do they call it? The mid-gate, uh, mid-flex, uh, multi-flex mid-gate. So the, at the front of the cab, it opens up in a different configurations so you can slide different length loads, you know, in, inside there. Like the bed itself is... Uh, is five foot eleven inches or 1.8 1.8 meters, uh, but that opens up in like the front seats fold down in a 60-40 situation, and the black the uh, back glass can come out as well. It's, so there's multiple configurations you can do with that, and then so you can extend that bed to was it uh, just short of eleven feet, so ten point ten feet inches, ten feet ten inches, which is uh, that's huge. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty cool. Um, you know, for my personal, I mean, I think it's a cool option and I'm sure some people would use it. I can't really think of a time where I ever really needed anything like that and where I wouldn't have minded just having my load hang over the edge of the tailgate a foot or two and, you right. know, tying a, a red flag around it. Sure. So I think it's kind of cool. And I'm sure 
there are certain people with particular needs, maybe a kayak, like you see there. I don't kayak, or at least I, I haven't picked up that hobby just yet. You should. Uh, it's really but, fun. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Uh, but, um, you know, I personally, I don't find that like, oh, wow, this is fantastic. I need that. Like I feel about the the front, the mega power front, which talking about the front, GM said that the, that, that the picture that you see for the Silverado front isn't the final production they they, they okay. haven't worked that all out yet so i mean that's how early on this is for them they haven't even locked in the front but it looks a lot smaller than the right. f1 not just a little smaller it actually looks like it's a lot smaller than the ford's mega power front it, it'll be interesting to see what the the final uh production is but i'd imagine it won't be too much different than that and for me having that huge cargo space up front uh, was was important for me with the F-150 because I know I'm going to use that a lot uh, and uh, I, I don't want to give up too much space. And it looks like the uh, Silverado's is 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 considerably smaller. I think what's interesting here is, is the way that they're going to come to market if they stick to the plan that was announced um, this week. A few ways of doing this. So the Tesla way, for instance, people would know that they announced a bunch of cars and then they start shipping the more expensive ones first. As a startup, I'm not sure how long we can continue to call Tesla a startup. But as a, as a younger company that gets money in the door, those cars have a higher margin. And people are expecting, you know, that they're, they, they're fine with that. So uh, they, they know they have to wait longer if they cheaped out. Uh, then there's the Ford way, right? So the Ford F-150 Lightning, um, they're going to make all versions, all variants of that at the same time. So whether that's the 40 grand pro version, which is the fleet car, or the you know, the, 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 the top spec, they're all going to roll down the assembly line and they're going to make them all at once. Again, it's Ford. They've been around a while. Uh, they've got all those processes in place. They've got some cash flow. They can do that. What's interesting here is they, um, they've made very clear that they're going to come to market first with the WT and the work truck will come spring and then at the end of next, so, so this time, well, spring next year, and then at the end of next year, they'll come with the consumer car. And again, I wonder how how people, our viewers, our listeners react to that because it, you know, they're going to see these cars flying around probably covered in dirt and muck and, and they're going to be working vehicles, they're fleet vehicles, and they can't get one to put on their driveway and yet they'll see a bunch of these cheaper looking, you know, it's not running on alloy wheels, it hasn't got any of the fancy bits that the, the 105 grand truck has got. And again, it might just be that that GM think that that's the way to go. That like the way to do it is to prioritize fleets, the working vehicle. This is the forty grand truck as well. So maybe that's the maybe that's the best way forward. But I don't know. I think you've got to capture people's imaginations and it's and not I think strategy, right? Tesla because... are good at capture. You know, Elon Musk is is one of his benefits is he's a great showman. Like he captures the imagination. People get pumped and psyched, and they'll leave their own money in you know as a deposit for years. Uh, and, and it's fine. They're really happy with that because they, they buy into the hype, the company, the dream, the mission, the goal, etc. And it's like, in a way, it feels like, hey, you guys spending 105 grand on your truck that is, is really desirable. You can wait. We're going to look after our fleet customers first. Don't get me wrong. That's what Rivian's doing with Amazon. Rivian are going to make a handful of trucks and SUVs, but they're going to be shipping that Amazon van out as quick as they can because Amazon's, been their, Amazon's been their paymaster all the way through to IPO, right? So they they got to keep Jeff happy. But um, but I don't know if annoying the average American uh, consumer is the right thing to do in favoring fleets. It's, it's a bit odd too because, like, if you think about it, fleets is traditionally where it's a, like a volume. It's they do it for volume. They don't do it for money. They don't they don't make a lot of you know margin on on fleet vehicles generally. So to, you know the roll it out. So it's, like you said, it's rolling out early. In the spring, and it's, it's, it's so uh, the work truck, um, it's, it's got this little bit down on power. It's like 510 horsepower and it's 615 uh, foot pound of torque. Whereas the other version, I think it's up over 600 some horsepower and uh, crazy levels of torque. I don't know. But in this one, it does like 8,000 pounds of towing. The RST that we saw, the top of the trim is like, uh, was it 10,000? Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, 10,000 maximum uh, trailing. Okay, and then, but this work truck actually at some point will get a, a fleet exclusive. There's going to be a, like a fleet exclusive model that will be able to uh, pull up to twenty thousand pounds, max trailing with a max tow package. That's which is kind of like crazy numbers, you know. That's uh, you know heavy duty truck numbers. 
Yeah. Um, uh, Marty here in the comments says fleet vehicles are a number one way to get cars into the hands of people who wouldn't otherwise drive electric. And I understand that. True. Benjamin has a similar point as well, saying it puts hand, uh, cars into the hands of anti-electric uh, drivers. If you're if your workplace, you know, if you're if you're out, you know, fixing telegraph poles for a living or whatever, you know, and, uh, you know, hey, here's your new work truck. Uh, stick your tools in the back. It's electric. Like, that's what you're going to drive. Um, right. It may ch change hearts and minds. Again, that's a really good point. Also, as well, uh, you know, remember that, that fleets are often working vehicles. And right. often uh, those vehicles are doing more mileage than the average car, which sits in your driveway from, you know, 92, 95% of the time. Our own cars are just sitting doing nothing. Fleets can often be working vehicles. What do we want to do to clean up the air? Well, that is get diesels off the road and get electric cars out there. And, and, and it would have a greater impact on air quality. I can make lots of arguments about why you'd want to do fleet first. I don't know if you win the battle with hearts and minds of your consumers by making those people wait another nine months. Right. Or the accountants. <laughs> At, at GM, well, yeah, or, I mean, you know, who wants that big margin money, you know? I don't know if I, miss, I misheard this or didn't understand it, but I don't think they were very clear on this work truck range because they talked a lot about the $105,000 uh, truck doing 400 miles right. using Ultium technology. But you can't surely sell a work truck that does 400 miles of range for 40 no. grand and make any kind of decent No, no, profit. it's going to have, it's going to be a, a 400 volt battery. And I, yeah, that's like a 250 it's mile range be, truck. I'm not, I'm not sure how much the size in kilowatt hours, but, uh, you know, I'm thinking 230 to 250 miles of range. I'm just yeah. like, like a guess. It's more like yeah, it. 250 tops. Okay, so for, then yeah, the vehicles 40, on the roads are these kind of underwhelming, kind of boring looking uh, right. vehicles that, uh, it could be any truck, really, even though they're, they're amazing vehicles. They're custom-designed EVs. They're not built on a, an existing platform, uh, you know, like the F-150. It's, it's, we should be really excited about this, and yet right. they're kind of underwhelming vehicles to come to the market first. Yeah. Right, so oh, I see the, uh, so the RST has 664 horsepower and more than 780 pound-feet of torque. That was the numbers for that. Um, Slightly more than the F-150 Lightning. Not much more. I think the F-150 has 775 pound-feet of torque. And, um, God, I forget the horsepower. Is it 580 or something like that? So it, it is more powerful, but not a whole lot more powerful. Right. Um, what was I wanted to say? There's a few other features I guess we should mention about the, uh, the Silverado EV. It has four-wheel steering, like or uh, at least optional. I'm not sure if that's a – I don't think that's standard. It's probably going to be an option – on the RST, so you know it'll probably be able to do the crab walking thing for, for the off-road vehicle. That's the trail boss. It's going to be like the off-road vehicle. They kind of tease that at the end. Oh, I wanted to mention that. Uh, so yeah, you were saying, Martin, that uh, with, with fleets they can get it in the hands of more people. They had a little segment at the end of the presentation where they had uh, Enterprise, the rental car company over here. Um, they talked about having some Silverados in their fleets as well, so people can. Uh, you know, because some people like to just rent a car. They want they're they're curious about a car. What what's it like to drive and you know experience. So they'll they'll rent rent one and you know have it for a, whatever a few days or a week and try it out and see if they like it enough to buy one. And so they they talk about that coming to you know the sort of the enterprise fleet, which is kind of cool. It means I can hopefully rent one and try it out. Yeah, I mean look, lots lots of reasons, lots of reasons why the fleet thing could be. Um, a good a good reason to come first, but it you know it's different. And I I, I should say, GM ship it, ship right. the vehicle, just right. ship it, just c crack on and make it. This this vehicle, if it was coming out now, would be like, oh okay, that's about right. Summer twenty twenty four for most people who aren't first edition. I mean that's that's really bad. And I tell you, and, and listeners of my podcast will know, and probably smile wryly uh, when I say this is that the last uh, the last few weeks. Um, there's just been a series of things that have just been making me more and more annoyed with with GM. Uh, and it was like the Nicola thing a year and a bit ago was just funny. It was just comical because like did nobody on the board do their due diligence? It was just like, what are you guys doing? But then I think the turning point was when Biden came out uh, and said, hey, Mary, you've electrified the uh, American auto industry. Um, how they and gave like others tesla and ford no credit at all um but then since then like they've kind of gone out of their way with these series of public announcements to say gm is leading the way we're you know we're leading the way we're going to be number one ev seller in 2025 was it 30 odd vehicles on the market in 2025 we're leading the way and it's like at some point and maybe i'm like the british take on it it's just 
it's just all mouth, no trousers. Do you know what I mean? There's just like, right. there's nothing there. There's no substance to it. There's one Hummer EV in the world which registered before New Year's Eve. That's one, true, right? One so, Hummer. So one. GM, they they GM, registered GM, one before New Year. Like, wait. at some point, just shut up and make vehicles. And, or maybe she's a genius and all, and like her pay is just linked to the stock price. And like, they know, they've seen what happens at Tesla. Just, just talk a good game and be like, yeah, uh, what do we need to say? Autonomy, self-driving, personal mobility, let's say autonomy a bit more, self-driving a bit more, uh, and electric stuff. And the share price will go up. We'll all make lots of money and, you know, go right. and learn how to kayak with Tom. I mean, right. I, like, I just don't know what that plan is at GM. Um, it, we don't get half these vehicles anyway, so I know I'm more detached and I'm less emotionally invested. Like Silverado means nothing right. um, to me. It could be that a lot of people watching this are like, yes, I've been waiting for a Silverado EV. I don't mind waiting a little bit longer, but hey, GM, just stop it with so much hot air. Well, just... uh, they're playing a bit of the long game, I guess. You know, they're trying to get their ducks in a row and they're building still the, like the big, the big thing with electric vehicles right now is to me is who, who can build, who can get the batteries to, to put in to build them you know you can't they can have vehicles you know lined up and out the door and engineered ready to go but if they don't have the battery supply you know lined up as well you know, they have nothing mm -hmm. so they're they're building a three i think different battery factories right now in north america but the first one should be finished like any time if it's not already done uh it should be you know yeah i actually have to have some something done because they need to supply the the hummers that are they should start regular production anytime soon they did put that one hummer ev out there because they had to you know hit that target <laughs> you know <laughs> to sell the hummers before the end of the year and they, they sold one but uh i, I agree know. tom i i think that's the wild card that gm has the ultium um battery that's it's their right. own it's 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 their own proprietary technology that they're going to be making it's 900 volt system uh, you know, I think, I think if if you're going to hang your hat on anything, if you're a big GM fan with regards to electrification, is that um, it might take them a little bit longer to get to market, but they're going to have something that's special and better than, say, Ford, who's just outsourcing batteries from a supplier. We don't right. know if that's going to be the case yet. Uh, but like I said, if you're a GM fan and you're 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 hold you're hold hold holding on to that hope that they may be a leader at some point. They're not the leader now that they're claiming no, they are, but no. they, 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 they may uh, be at some point. Uh, if, 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 if you're holding on to that hope, it's you're, you're putting all your, your, your chips yeah. on Ultium. And right. uh, you know, let's see, it's, it's yet to be known if, if, if that is as good as GM says it is, but you know, it's, I like the fact that they went and developed their own uh, battery, and they're they're develop they're they're going to be making their own batteries and not just you know outsourcing and saying okay what's available out there let's buy a bunch let's make a contract with LG Chem let's do a contract with S Samsung they're they're bringing it in house and uh, that's the one thing that I'm holding on to with 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 GM and we we, we won't know for a year or two if if they um, if they made the right bet right. So at the at the end of that Silverado EV presentation, Mary Barra had a one more thing moment and revealed some images and info about an upcoming Chevrolet Equinox EV and Blazer EV. Uh, now we didn't get to see the Blazer EV at all, but we did see images of the Equinox EV in two different trims, uh, both the interior and exteriors. And we learned that the Equinox EV would be in the thirty thousand dollar neighborhood, which is good, and launch in the fall of twenty twenty three. Uh, so not this fall, but next, which is you know the same time frame as I guess the the trucks um I, I guess the RST Silverado EVs will probably hit the road sooner before before this but uh so we talk a lot we talk about uh, a lot of expensive cars here on the podcast of course but thirty thousand dollars isn't so bad especially considering you know the average transaction prices in 2021 was about forty one thousand dollars so Tom, what do you think of what they've shown so far here? Like I, I saw these vehicles or mock-ups of these vehicles at, on EV Day like a couple of years ago. So they've they've had this in mind, and now they're finally showing us something. This is huge. This is oh. bigger than Silverado, okay. um, in my opinion. Uh, I I'm a previous owner of a uh, of an Equinox. I had a 2011 LTZ, and when that when I first got that, it was right at the beginning of electrification. It's right when the Volt had just come out. I mean, I, I think I got it like a month after the Volt's first deliveries. And I remember saying to myself, GM made the mistake here. They shouldn't have created a new vehicle with the Volt. 
they should have put Voltec in an Equinox, yeah. made a, a, a an EREV Equinox with 35, 40 mile range. It would have killed, uh, you know, and, and I still believe that. I still think they should have electrified the, uh, the, the Equinox. It's such a popular vehicle for them. I, I loved my Equinox. I thought it was a great compact crossover SUV. I think it's perfect for families. And uh, at a $30,000 price point, it is huge. Simon says it's a winner. Uh, if if that's 30k, it's a winner. I Simon, you're 10,000 percent correct. If they can bring this in at somewhere around 30,000 dollars, it's game over for 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 ICE. It really is because that's what we need to get affordable family electric vehicles. I mean, the Lucid Air is great. You know, even the 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 you know 80,000 dollar pickup trucks are great. I, sure. I love them, but this is what really will move the needle and. Uh, you know, I, I think I'd get one. I mean, I love we, we my wife and I loved right. our Equinox. It was a great vehicle. Uh, if you could put that thing out for thirty thousand dollars, you don't need incentives anymore at that point. Right. And, it looks uh, nice in the RST trim that we see on yeah, the screen here. It looks it looks so cool. And uh, I mean, this is what we need to get to to really get people out of uh, ICE vehicles. Is is that thirty thousand dollar or sub thirty thousand dollar? small or compact crossover SUV that everybody buys these days. Go in parking lots. It's all you see is RAV4s, CRVs, right. Equinox. I mean, it's it, they're, it seems like they're 50 to 60% of the market. I, I know that it, that's not the case, but you would think that if you go look in a, in, in, in a, in a parking lot and bring this out, you know, and, and at, at that price point, forget about it. It's, but there's no reason like a, to buy an ice. That's like Bolt EV territory. Exactly. You know, yeah. and it's, and it's, and it's, you know, 30% bigger than a larger than a, than a Bolt EV, you know, it'll or, charge faster. Ex exactly. I mean, that's, you know, when we get to, when this, when this is sitting in showrooms and, you know, it's like I said, there's, there's very little reason to walk into a showroom and get the, 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 the ice version of the Equinox. If, if this is 30 K. Right. And Martin, you had any, any thoughts on this before I move on? Not a car that we get here, but, um, that's the that's the price point right at right. which point you end up because these cars will be inevitably paid for monthly um by right. families that just want something to to get around and they don't care whether it's electricity or gas and if they can save money you know if we can get people inside evs for a uh, pardon the pun uh for um, a reasonable amount of money they'll save it on the running costs and so many people are spending you know the, all they do is is they're taking their kids to school and they're taking uh you know their kids and, and doing errands at the weekends and not really doing any great distances, but spending two, three, four hundred dollars a month on on gas. But because it's something that you've always done, it's something that you don't question, and you've got no option. You know that you can't. There's no alternative because EVs are so expensive. If we can get electric cars into the hands of um, you know middle class people and and you know working Americans, and this I would just I said not a brand that we have here, not a car that we have here. But I think I read something this week that that is the second best selling nameplate for the company. Okay. Like, so I'm like, oh, okay. Right. I didn't appreciate it. it was such a bigger deal for you. Yeah. Like, and actually, I made a I made a Christmas Day podcast um, that was my five Christmas wishes that you know Santa could bring, and and one of those five was that we electrify established names. So uh, whilst I totally appreciate what VW have done with the ID, and they want to create something new, lots of political reasons like Dieselgate getting away from stuff there rather than just making the electric Golf or the electric Polo, etc. I get why companies do that, but I think there's so much power in the next stage of the curve of people buying EVs of just taking a name that you know and love that you've had, you know, a bunch of these cars over the years. Oh, and you've got a new one. It happens to be electric. And it, it, it demystifies electric vehicles when it's that name that you're so familiar with and looks exactly the same. Um, and, and, you know, look at, at, at how many uh, RAV4 Primes uh, are being right. sold, like 10,000 10, in quarter four um, that Toyota. And they, would, they, they could have doubled that if they'd made more of them, you know. So every RAV4 Prime that, that Toyota make and bring to North America is being sold. Um, if they bought more to the market, more people, there's a long waiting list. Because right. people love that car. It's actually a really good plug-in hybrid that suits lots of people's use cases. So I'm delighted that they're taking um, a, a, fam a, a famous name, and it just happens to be electric. It's not right. a big deal. That's an interesting thing you mentioned about the names. Like I never really kind of thought about that or you know put too much thought. Because it's like a different vehicle, but if the name's the same, then people feel like they may have a connection to it and be more likely to get into it. 
Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so someone was asking uh, on Facebook, Lou Verder asked, uh, they missed the pr projected range of the EV Equinox. They didn't give one, um, mm -hmm. but since it's coming out in two years, it's got to be, you know, it's got to hit 300 miles, I think. I don't know, Tom, you get a quick word. It could be slightly, it could be 275, 300, somewhere around there. Uh, to me, t 250 is like that magic number. Uh, that ma magic range number. Right. Uh, if the vehicles can recharge quickly, you got to remember, I, 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 I'm a firm believer that as infrastructure improves, as it becomes ubiquitous, I think ranges are going to pull back. I don't think it's going to be as important to have a 350 to 400 mile range. If you can easily DC fast charge the vehicle, you know, within 10 minutes of your house, you know, with, if, if it's a if, if it's a 10 or 15 or at most 20 minute stop to get you know close to 80 percent charged you really don't need to carry around that heavy battery and that's going to bring down the cost of the vehicles so to me 250 to 275 works if the infrastructure is in place and this equinox is a few years out let's face it uh, i forget uh dumb did they say when is it 2024 2024 fall fall of 23 so Okay, so yeah, it's 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 a couple of years out. You know, I mean, if it starts in in, in the fall twenty twenty four, it probably won't get big production until about this time in twenty twenty five or twenty twenty four. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's two it's it's two you know two two years out. Uh, infrastructure is going to dramatically increase in in the right. last two years. What we've seen in in this country is amazing with infrastructure, and now even more money is getting poured into it. So I think twenty twenty four twenty twenty five. It's it's right around 2025. I think we're going to start to see manufacturers start to pull back with the with, with ranges because it won't be as important. Right. All right. So uh, let's definitely move on. by the end of the sorry, Dom. Huh? Definitely by the end of this decade. I I believe 100 percent by 2028 2029. You're gonna you're gonna absolutely see the the single charge range. The average range is going to be increasing, increasing as it is. I think in right. 2020, the average, the median range of a new electric vehicle in the U.S. was 259 miles. Um, that was the median range of, of, of all the electric vehicles announced. I think we're going to see that increase. But then sometime after 2025, we're going to start to see the average um, range pull back. Really? I think that's the uh, 2025. That's kind of like the date for the like new, the next generation of technology, to, the battery technology to happen as well. Like the solid state, people have mentioned 2025. We'll see if that happens for real. But um, and that'll give us you know a lot of a um, lot of energy in a in a lighter, uh, just a better better package and quicker faster mm -hmm. charging and just you know better better you know qualities. Yeah, and let, let me let me let me clarify something. Simon and Scott was talking about. Um, do you mean 10 minutes from your house or your apartment, maybe? Yeah, apartment, because if you live in a private residence, you can, you can charge overnight. Now it becomes even less important to have really long range. Uh, but people that live in apartments, multifamily dwellings that can't charge at home, they need to have access to DC fast charging and they yeah. need to be able to do it quickly. So, yeah, it's, it's much more important uh, for uh, DC fast charging to be located close to multifamily dwellings. Right now, that's not the case, especially in cities. There's very few options of DC fast charging. We have to improve that infrastructure for uh, the people that live in, 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 in multifamily dwellings. We currently don't have that. It's very poor access right. to people that live in cities. Mo most of these DC fast chargers are along major corridors and enabling long distance driving, which was the low hanging fruit. Right. But we need to get them now in, in city centers and areas where people um don't have access to charge at home. See, uh, Electri Electrify America uh, was is really focusing, like like you said, on those you know uh, multi interstates uh, areas where people can you know charge up while they're traveling, which makes sense. And EVgo, they mentioned they're they're uh, they're planning on, on building more side inside cities and things like that. But we haven't heard a lot from them recently, so maybe interest uh, might be interesting to catch up with them and see what's going on there. Because yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, there's a big hole in, in the market in, the, in need for in, inside cities charging. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. we need to do a dedicated podcast on infrastructure. I know we've been saying that, right. but let's let's let, let's. I could even reach out to like Electrify America, EVGo, Blink, uh, you know, ChargePoint. Maybe we'll do a dedicated um, show cool. and have like one representative from each company on and talk to each one for like ten or fifteen minutes. 
we'll see if we can we can we can arrange that, guys. I think that'd be a really good um, say like midweek bonus show. Ah, uh, yeah. Hey, speaking mm. of which, we might have a midweek bonus show next week too, right? Possibly. Yeah. That'd be no, cool. we won't. Oh, okay. Oh, we won't. Okay. Ooh, okay. <laughs> At the department. Oh, oh, of, we're working I'll, on. I'll we're, talk to you guys later. We're, it's yeah. More we're working on trying to get you some. Month. I'm, I'm right. trying um, to get it scheduled. It looks okay. like it's going to happen towards the end of the month. Okay, the department we'll, we'll, of um, your your department of energy at uh, energy.gov do like a fact of the day or fact of the week, um, and they put one out uh, around the new year, uh, which was twenty five percent of apartment owners in the U.S. Uh, have either access to uh, electric for charging a car or even the potential to access. So that's a quarter of apartment oh, dwellers okay. have access or even the potential for electricity to be installed for. So a huge job for those that live in, you know, multi-dweller, uh, you know, buildings because right. that's like 75% either have no access or even potential to access electricity to charge their car. A right. huge huge I number. I mean, people. but if you're living in a city, a lot of people don't even have cars in the city, so you know, it all, I don't know if it's yeah, like as big so. a challenge as quite 75% of, you know, all those people yeah. actually need that. Yeah, it's but, a good shout. Yeah, but, a good yeah. but anyway, we should move on to something else. Time is over, not so bad. Uh, so on Monday, Mercedes introduced the Vision EQXX Dosa Keys, uh, EQ Dosa Keys, um, <laughs> designed and engineered with maximum efficiency in mind. It has the lowest drag coefficient of any car they've produced before. It's 0.17. Um, and they, they, yeah, they had a study a couple of years ago. It was like 0.19, I believe. But yeah, you can see here on your screen if you're watching us on YouTube or Twitch or Facebook or or Twitter. Um, so they say it can achieve a range of over a thousand miles or a thousand kilometers. Sorry, uh, 620 miles uh, using a battery that's less than 100 kilowatt hours. So it's powered by a 150 kilowatt motor on the rear axle. So that's like 201 horsepower. The uh, powertrain, Mercedes says, is so efficient that 95% of, of the energy from the battery powers the wheels, which is very good, I think. Uh, the roof has solar cells, which feeds into a separate, uh, we call it lithium iron phosphate battery, which powers many of the ancillary electric systems, like the blower for the HVAC system and uh, lights and infotainment. Uh, so they say it can free up an extra 15 miles of range. Uh, so it's almost five inches shorter than a C-Class, so it's not huge, and weighs 3,858 pounds or 1,750 kilograms. Uh, Mercedes says that the EQXX previews a future production vehicle, but they are not saying when that might happen. Martin, we love all the efficiency, but uh, how different do you think a production version would have to be? I think Mercedes were clear this is not going to go into production. It won't be a production version, but it's, it's a, a collection of technologies and thoughts around what will go into production. So, yeah, you're right. All of the things on this car, they are thinking could well go into um, production at some point. I read two things about the battery. Uh, I read uh, I, I read both that they are the, the battery that would theoretically be in this to give 620 miles, 1,000 kilometers, is their next generation kind of technology where they are working on, on thermal management. Um, but I also read that they'd taken the EQS battery um, and slimmed it down. So I, I don't know, which, I, I couldn't get clarification on, on right. you know, is it their existing EQS battery modified or is it whole new battery technology that they're working on with their battery partners on this and you know what was interesting is there's no thermal management on no there's no active liquid thermal management on the battery in this to either heat it up or cool it down because oh, really? the point of this was not to be a high performance car the right, mercedes wanted to make this in order to say let's get a i think the naught to 60 time they say that if if you had to really uh, give it a naught to 60 i think they said it was eight seconds or seven point nine seconds something like that they're like yeah but that's not the point of this car the point is lower power lower top speed it was 88 or 90 miles an hour top speed that's not the point of this car the point of it was is how light how efficient could we make a, a vehicle today not let's put some numbers on a screen this is what's great about what mercedes-benz have done here not let's put numbers on a, a screen and do a keynote and say, isn't the world great? Uh, we can make these magical cars in a few years' time. Knowing what we know now, how can we add light weighting? How can we, like, again, if you're watching the bits, uh, the YouTube or the Twitch stream, like, how can we have, uh, how do we get rid of 
um, shock absorbers and how do we get rid of suspension parts that are very very heavy in cars well uh, we could we could use uh, a new kind of technology that looks kind of crazy uh and i'm not sure what it's made out of but some kind of spring thing uh that looks like it's 3d printed that does the same thing and is half the weight and so they've gone through the whole vehicle going actually what have we got access to from our formula one teams they've worked with their mercedes-benz um world championship winning formula one team their formula e teams and all the various bits of the company like what's out there that we could use so the battery has no uh is has a um a, a solid plate that runs underneath it and relies purely on air cooling because if you're not demanding high performance of two seconds naught to 60 and track mode etc then actually what can we do with the battery that doesn't have all of that uh, cooling around it? Or take all that weight out, add all that efficiency, take off the cost as well. And can we keep a battery within its window using just air cooling? And they can. And so it's a bunch of technologies that will come to market. It's really, really exciting uh, what they've done here because they've been very, I just think, practical about these things and uh, and of course the number they set was a thousand kilometers because they knew that would get headlined they were right. uh, they were open they were like when we went into this what should we pick let's pick a thousand because it's the number that will get attention and then they they hit it with this with this vehicle with a a very small battery pack yeah 100 kilowatt hours isn't it so it's less than less than that it's 30 percent lighter than the one in the eqs uh, by the way so uh as so. well as a smaller footprint hey so uh Simon Matthews says the guy from Fully Charged said the back seat was a joke, but he's six foot five. Uh, I brought that up at some point, and uh, apparently, the back seats. If you look at the interior shot of it, the back seats are reclined somewhat, so they they kind of instead of you know, they just make people sit sit back so so they don't you know rub their head against the ceiling. So well, I, I mean, that was it's the, not yeah, it's it's as Martin said though, Dom. It's it's not meant to be practical because it's not meant to go into production. It's a it's an exercise in what could we do, and I think it's a learning experience. Um, personally, it looks to me like they took the um, light year one, right. and you know, Mercedesified it. Right. I understand. <laughs> you know? it would be, it, it would, now I, you I say that they're supposed to, like they're supposed to be like a production version or some something about this going into production. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and I, I, remember, I remember hearing that it would be cheaper than a light year one for sure, which you can tell us about that. It's on our screen right now. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, the light year one, I, I got an opportunity to check it out at CES two years ago. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's supposedly going into production pretty soon, but I couldn't help but think almost every angle you look at, at the vehicle, the right. front, the side, the rear, it shape. really looks like Mercedes just said, okay, let's start with this and let's make it look cooler and more expensive and more exotic and right. uh but this is what we're going to work with <laughs> i think so. the mercedes actually has a, a slightly lower coefficient of drag though even even though this uh, yeah, is like it'll be, designed it will for be it. the lowest uh, yeah. of any of any production car but they might get around that because this isn't in production yet so maybe that was how they got around it but look uh, uh you know looking down at the dashboard and seeing six miles per kilowatt hour working on that if it, that, that that level of efficiency is just amazing and it, it does circle back to what tom said earlier which is let's make battery packs smaller let's have fewer resources dug out of the ground uh, because it's less weight it's less of an impact in terms of the um just the, the the natural resources going into vehicles and let's make things that are fit for purpose and if you need an ev that does 200 miles of range and that's all you need with occasional long distances well then have that ev don't right. have a bunch of spare capacity weight cost sitting on your driveway it's a bit like the tesla model s mule vehicle this week that was in the news there's a battery company in all oh, right uh connecticut yeah. maybe there's a battery company that have um power one or uh one um i think all the other one um and they yeah they so they were taking their latest um pretty high cobalt batteries i think it was um and putting them into a model s mule car and getting like 800 miles out of it and again well what would you rather would you like but it's 200 kilowatt hours um so what would you like would you like 800 miles of range or would you like uh, a smaller lighter battery that does maybe three or four hundred um it, it, uh, as the as evs evolve we'll be able to get more new and nuanced rather than just you know when they need to get the hummer to go that far just put a double stack 200 kilowatt hour battery in and be done with it right well i think the point isn't just that they can fit a 200 kilowatt hour battery pack in the footprint of the model s 
Uh, but the, the to me, the real point is that means they can get a hundred kilowatt hour battery pack in half the size. Yes, with yes, half the yes. weight. You right. know, and have this compact battery pack um, that, you know, hopefully, you know, reduces cost, reduces weight, reduces everything. I mean, that's really what we want to do. We want to get these vehicles more efficient. We want the battery packs to be smaller, you know, and, and with an, accepta- an acceptable range. I mean, these giant, you know, you take, for instance, the Hummer EV and the Silverado, it's 200 kilowatt hour battery packs. Oh, that, that's great for today because that's the best right. we can do. But we want the Silverado... A pickup truck of the future to go 300 plus miles with a battery pack that's a third of that size, you know, and we'll right. get there. It's going to take many iterations and many advancements in in, in uh, battery technology, but, you know, we, we don't want a, a 1,200 pound battery pack needed uh, to be hauling that thing around when you're going to pick up groceries around around the block. You know, you want a battery pack, ideally, that's a few hundred pounds and um, right. it's going to take time, but we'll get there. But in the, in the case of the truck, that because uh, having a heavy battery limits the amount of payload that you can actually carry. I believe the uh, the Silverado EV. I forget what the payloads were, but you know they were just just over a half ton. They weren't they weren't crazy. You know, huge numbers as far as like payload. They can tow a lot, but they can't sit a lot in the bed. And, and as batteries get smaller, they can you know increase that amount. Um, but uh, let's move on to uh, let's see. Let's move on to the Chrysler Airflow. Um, so yeah, Chrysler un- officially unveiled its airflow concept at CES. We'd seen it before during the big Stellantis EV day uh, last summer, and again, uh, more recently at its software day. But this time uh, we got a much better look inside and out. And I'm not sure if that, there's much changes, but it sure looks a lot better than what I remember f- from before. Um, they say it'll get up to 400 miles of range and have a 300 kilowatt or 402 horsepower all wheel drive powertrain. So 150 kilowatts on each axle. Um, and there's a possibility that it could get an 800 volt architecture. They didn't say that, but they've, they've talked about that in the past. Um, there weren't a whole lot of details given on charging. Um, it looks reasonably production ready, but the big issue here with, it, you know, is again, the time frame. it's only going on sale in 2025. Mm-hmm. Like Tom, the brand it's, itself is supposed to be all electric, electric by 2028. Uh, has Stellantis like waited too long to introduce an electric Chrysler or do you think this will even sell three years from now? It, it's hard to look into the crystal ball. I think it would right. be great if it was coming out in 2022, Don. Wouldn't wouldn't you? I mean, it looks yeah, it looks like cool. Year. It's got good specs. But again, you know, um, it's hard to get excited about something that we're talking about three three plus years from now. Who right. knows what like the next generation Hyundai will be on the you know the GMP platform or what Volkswagen's going to be bringing out uh, in 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 twenty twenty five. So you know it's 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 disappointing. They're obviously a laggard at this point. You know the uh, the brand is a laggard with electrification, and um, you know it's it's going to be interesting to see how that works for them. Uh, it's it looks cool, but I mean for crying out loud, three three, three plus years from now, uh, it's it's. Yeah doesn't work for that for me at least right i'm not sure i'm like still Stellantis has so they have some electric vehicles on the european brands right they have the fiat 500e over there and they have i don't know what's the other brands martin that the Stellantis has in europe i i mean the the bits of the group psa that they inherited uh they have loads of electrification mm-hmm. there in small family-sized cars and so that bit of the business is making vehicles right now and actually commercial vehicles um, right. And so, the, like the panel vans and stuff, there's loads of those. They all come with exactly the same um, spec of uh, 100 kilowatt motor, 100 kilowatt DC fast charging, 50 kilowatt hour battery. That's pretty much the spec they've gone with for nearly all their vehicles. And so, um, there's a ton of electrification experience within the Group PSA half or bit of Stellantis. Uh, I don't right. know. I mean, hey, bringing two big companies together, it's always integration is tough. Uh, there's always politics and you just think hey why can't you just take the best bits and and and, and pull it in but we don't right. know what's happening behind the behind the scenes there and i wasn't just, really referring to stellantis per se as right. much as i was talking about chrysler right. talking about being a laggard you know right. the, the chrysler american brand, side of things for, for sure you know is right. is you know there's no other way to to describe them but to say that they're a laggard i know stellantis has i mean they've got a few dozen different vehicles electric vehicles out there in, in europe at least mm. uh, that's available but you know for here uh, looking u.s centric chrysler is absolutely 
um, behind Chrysler, the behind Chrysler the Dodge and, and Ram. One hundred percent. Yes, that, that, that that whole brand is 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 kind of floundering when it comes to electrification. Right. So we had a little article, I believe, yesterday on Inside EVs that the, the the Ram pickup truck designers or engineers they're kind of looking at what, what Ford and GM and everyone else is doing and kind of like you know make, changing their approaches, you know. But oh man, I really feel like they're I don't know are they going to be too late? Is it? Uh, it's like the like the you know it's like GM's a little late, a little slow, but these guys are like another level above that. You know, it's like. Depending on how fast transitions happen, this whole the whole North American you know brands could you know really hold Stellantis back overall. I don't know. I don't yeah, think I they're don't... too late personally. Mm. Okay. I, I, if they put out good products, you know, right. if if they come late and put out you know electric vehicles that were comparable to what the uh, the the leaders were putting out now or even earlier, then yeah, you know, I mean, you look at like Mazda for instance. You know, um, right. they're late to market. And 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 they didn't come out with something that was contemporary. I mean that right. that you know that vehicle should have been launched four years ago or five years ago. So you know it depends what Chrysler does. I I don't think it's too late for anybody at this point. Okay. I think I think the, these established big OEMs, the Toyotas that have tons of money, that Stellantis has deep pockets. If if they invest in the right technology and they put forth. Good electric vehicles, even if it's two or three years from now, I think they'll be just fine. The the question is, will they be able to do that? And can they, you know, will they have the the right vision and 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 bring the right vehicles forward? Uh, and right. That's the big question. I just look at, at companies like Kia and Hyundai, you know, who are doing such great things with their vehicles with the super fast charging and, and good ranges and packaging and everything. And man, this it's going to be tough. To, I think to match some of those things. Yeah. Uh, uh, tough, yeah, but they can do it. They've got and they've got the engineers uh, okay. to do it. I, it's still early. We're still at what two, three percent adoption for electrification. Um, there, there's time, but right. you know, it's it's getting late <laughs> yeah. soon. Hey, so uh, we got to end the show up, wrap the show up pretty, pretty soon. But I did want to mention that the uh, Sony <laughs> was kind of interesting. They had uh, so we we they've showed us this like uh, concept car. Sony who doesn't make cars. Uh, hmm. The Vision S before and so at ces they brought it to ces but they also brought a, a small suv or crossover suv the vision s02 and and then and they announced that they're seriously considering you know becoming an automaker and it looks like you know you don't just make two concept cars uh, for the fun of it so you know they could get together with uh, with a supplier like magna a contract manufacturer and and start producing and they look great too i think i don't know Martin, what uh, do you think? Of Sony came to CES, was it two years ago now, with the Vision S, right? Um, and it, it looked finished, and ha and they have been driving it around. It's been spy shots of it, not in camo, just driving around. Uh, certainly in Japan as well, they've been driving this around, doing tests. And for the last two years, Sony have been saying, "We're not going to make cars. We're not going to make cars." And then they keep showing this Vision S, and they say, "We're not going to make cars. It's just a test bed for technology. We're not going to make cars." And then they turned up at CES this year. And said, "Oh well, we have registered a company called Sony Mobility. Is that what it was called? They've launched a new company, anyway. Right. Um, um, and uh, and oh, and we, I think we will make cars. Like obviously, everyone knew that. Stop denying it. And so yeah, to come with an SUV, of course they come with an SUV because everybody wants to buy SUVs. Uh, they look great. The yeah, you know, the the best thing is is surely uh, for those people that can't get their hands on a PlayStation Five because they're still in short supply. The easiest thing to do is just to buy a brand new car that's bound to have a." PS5 inside it, surely. Right. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, we talk about gaming in Teslas, but I mean, heck, can you imagine what gaming is going to be like inside a Sony car? It's just going to have a PlayStation inside it. It's going to be brilliant. So I mean, uh, that's the great thing is that we're talking about cars coming from the likes of um, Sony and Huawei and uh, and who's the uh, Taiwanese uh, Foxconn, and it's like all of these names in tech that would have been at CES to talk about you know TVs or mobile phones. They're like, oh, we're going to make a car now. I love it. It's all brilliant. Right. I mean, that's a, that's her forte, right? Consumer electronics and cars are, you know, integrating those kind of things more and more all the time. And they so, know what people want. So they're right. very good at understanding consumers. So great. And the, uh, we're looking at interior shots of the car now and, and, you know, it looks, looks fine. It looks like as good or better than a lot of other vehicles. They go seven seats. Look at that. I didn't notice that before. 
if you back up one one uh, thing, oh yeah, it's got, uh, it's got a third row back there in the uh, one more. Yeah, that way. There you go. Look, yeah. uh, you got to have pretty it's short tight. legs, it's, you know, for the kids, you know. <laughs> but like you know, like the Model Y or there was what's that Volkswagen? I've it's uh, not a not an electric Volkswagen. Yeah. They have like a very small third row as well, like that. It's like I couldn't fit in it. It was like ridiculously small. <laughs> but yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, I wanted to mention before we left too that the uh, on inside of these we have a, a a piece on the 2023 BMW iX M60, which is like a performance version, like a super super perform uh, you know X, the iX we were talking about earlier that you know Tom and Kyle love so much. Um, 155 miles an hour, maybe it has a better. I haven't actually had a chance to <laughs> dive deep in this article myself, actually, to be perfectly honest. But I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it. It looks like a you know a Model X uh, performance uh, competitor, I would say. Yeah, it comes this summer for UK and Europe, and we are in Europe, I should say. Uh, but it comes this summer over here. I know you guys have got to wait till next year, or at least for the next model year, um, to get this. But yeah, we get that. Uh, it goes into production in spring, deliveries in summer, and okay. uh, and lots of lots of funky stuff in here, like uh, uh, their new version of adaptive air suspension, um, and everything is tuned to be just a little bit hotter. It's the it's going to be the flagship electric M car. Um, for uh, for BMW, everything is the same. Like the battery pack is the same. I think the motors are the same, but turned up. And uh, I can't think of any massively different specs on the car. I did read about right. it earlier in the week. Well, but the, it, you know, it's it, it, if you're going to put down 150 grand on this, um, but you'd be looking at this or a Model X Plaid, wouldn't you? All oh, right, Plaid. I said I call the Model X performance Model X Plaid. Yeah, right. So <laughs> you're gonna be, you, but you're in that you're in that territory of uh, what very very fast SUV do I want? Right. Um, so I have to say you, you have to really be into performance to want to to want to jump up to this because I drove the um, iX uh, X Drive fifty and yeah. I drove it a lot, almost two hundred miles around Germany, and um, I tell you the performance on that was was fantastic. You know, right. it's it's kind of like you know that's how i feel about the, the and i'm a i like performance and that's how i feel about the model s it's like the model s long range is 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 so powerful oh, man, and so crazy. fast it's, it's so like to, to spend that extra 35 grand on the plaid it's just because you want to say you have a plaid i mean, <laughs> okay. I mean that's it that's you know, the only because, reason because honestly like kyle like, yeah you know, i mean kyle loves that extra Juice, it's you know? such a small like difference. It's like it, it it it's crazy how fast the long range was. So that's kind of how I feel about the 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 iX. The X Drive fifty is powerful. It handles wonderfully. Everything about it is such a good package, and it's not crazy expensive. I mean, it starts at like eighty or eighty two, something like that. So to me, honestly, relatively speaking, yeah. I listen. I. When you compare it to the other right. high performance crossovers, right. it's less expensive than a, than than a Model X. Not even the Model X play it. You know, they're just the regular Model X. It's less expensive than and and I said this, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, and Kyle seemed to 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 reiterate what what I was saying today was that if you're thinking about getting a Model X, go drive the iX first, uh, because yeah. it, it drive drives it drives amazingly. And yeah. uh, you know, I know that the. the <laughs> The front of the vehicle is hard on the eyes. Uh, there's no hiding it. I mean, you can get darker colored, the gray or the black, and it kind of makes it look a little bit different. But um, hey, the Model X is no is no beauty, uh, right? Either right. you know, it's, I mean, it's not like it's not like exactly. The, you know, it's not you know sculpted work of art that you're going to see in a Euros. museum yeah. somewhere. Uh, but but the 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 iX drives so well, and uh, I think it's a great great option. I mean the the one thing that I'll still say, and we bring this up all the time, is it doesn't have supercharger network. Well, at uh, least not no. yet. Tesla right. might open that up to, to the other vehicles. That is still, and it remains to be a huge advantage for Tesla. Right. And Electrify America is, you know, building out fast and improving their thing. But, you know, honestly speaking, Tesla supercharger network, you know, has the edge. You know, I think everyone will. Hands that. down. Yeah. But, you know, the future is, a, you know, a whole new place. So we'll see how, well, how that works out. Uh, until then, uh, that brings us to the end of our show, I think, unless anyone has anything else they want to bring up real quick. Nope. Okay. Nope. So if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them on the Inside EVs Forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. Oh, I meant to mention before. So we have a new sub forum for the uh, uh, Chevrolet Equinox uh, 
uh, EV and Blazer EV, actually, if you're interested, as well as the Silverado EV, of course. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in those vehicles, jump over to the uh, Inside EVs forum and set yourself up with a, an account and, you know, chat with us about what you want, what you, what you, what you hope for. Uh, so anyway, if you like the show, uh, please give us a thumbs up if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom Longley at Tomalog, that's with two M's. Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. Kyle Connor is at It's Kyle Connor. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Uh, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week. Ciao.